Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Matt Lumpkin. Matt is a restlessly creative person. His career has been focused on user experience design and digital product strategy. But three years ago, his daughter's diagnosis with type 1 diabetes sent him down the path of questioning why medtech design was so poor. Hint, it's designed for the wrong stakeholders with the wrong incentives. Matt maintains an art practice in photography, painting, and wood sculpture. He's slowly solving all the design problems in the home he shares with his wife and three daughters by crafting wooden furniture with hand tools on his back patio. Boy, that sounds fun. He's also product designer at Tidepool.org, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Hey, Matt, welcome to Cool Tools. Hey, Mark. I'm so happy to be here. uh, I'm a longtime listener and um, just really thrilled to be on the show. And I'm so delighted to to meet you uh, virtually, acoustically. (laughs) <laughs> um, and uh, here are the cool tools that you have in store for us. Absolutely. So, Matt, uh, you were referred to us by uh, our mutual friend, Mino Palouse. And uh, Mino, I-, I am forever grateful with him for teaching me that Open G tuning when he was a guest on our <laughs> show a couple months ago. It's really a great way to play guitar. And uh, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, and so you are... Uh, a musician as well, and your first pick is music related, and it's something that's really cool. So, so tell us about it and uh, what it looks like, because it, it's visually pretty stunning. Yeah, so this is a this is a synthesizer. It's called a pocket piano from this little boutique uh, uh, make uh, shop called Critter and Guitari, and they make all kinds of um, a very simple, very uh, you might say quirky, I would say deceptively simple instruments that often get mistaken for toys. So this looks like a piece of it, I think it's actually just a sheet of steel that's been bent around in kind of a U shape uh, to make like a, a surface. Uh, and it's got um, two octaves, two and a half octaves of, of little maple keys. And you can kind of kind of hear them like as you as you touch the keys, like they make this sort of clocky sound because it's just a piece of maple like floating over a regular like on off switch. And it has mm-hmm. four knobs. And basically these knobs control volume and then three other attributes of the synth engine that you're playing. And it runs on a nine volt and has its own battery. I'm going to turn it on right now. Uh, so, how, and how how big is it? Uh, it is about um, eight inches by three inches by one and a half inches. Um, so about well, about half the the size of a computer keyboard I'm looking at. And it's just this handheld little box that can make all these lovely sounds. And if you if you realize that the the keys they look like circles but they're organized in a piano pattern and so it's like this little pocket piano um and so it's uh it's and but it can do it can do regular sort of synth tones and do really wild crazy stuff um but it's it's like i said it's deceptively simple in that like um you can play it you can put it on the couch you can whenever you're bored you can grab it and just fiddle with it if you're uh, I, for, for for years, I was so busy with kids and work and everything that I didn't have. I was trying to find places for music to fit in my life. And I would bring it into uh, the uh, bath time when I would give my kids a bath. And I would sort of play these crazy synth tunes uh, with them while I was there uh, to their uh, either enjoyment or frustration, depending on the child. Does it does it record um, what's being played? No, it's, it's dead simple. Uh, it just it has a quarter inch output. It also you can plug it in with an adapter. It also can send and receive MIDI, um, but it just, it's it, it's an instrument. And so uh, what I love about it is like, unlike so many other synthesizers, and I, I'm a big synth and gearhead, um, but like it it doesn't have any patch storage. Like you, you turn it on and you pretty quickly learn what it can and can't do. And then you just get muscle memory with it. Like you can really just play it like any other instrument. And because like, you know, I have guitars and violins and other stuff hanging around the house. What I love about this synth is I can just pick it up and grab it and fiddle around with it if I'm bored or if I'm just like feeling like playing something. So 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 the main way that you listen to it is from this little built-in speaker that it has, but you said you say that it has some other plugs, which I'm assuming 
means that you could plug an amplifier into it and you could play it in louder if you wanted to. That's that exactly right? right. And and once you hear this synth engine, you start to hear it all over uh, lots of different music because um, you can you can drive it with other keyboards by doing going MIDI into it. It has a regular quarter inch jack out, so you can plug it into a guitar amp or whatever other amp you want. Um, and it uh, what I would commonly do is I would plug it into another synth and then that has like a full size keyboard and then play chords into it and then have be having like poly polyphonic synth chords coming off the synth that I'm playing, but then also driving arpeggios from this. Wait a minute. So, so, so I, I need to unpack that a little bit. So <laughs> uh, if I can understand what you're saying, when you plug another synthesizer into this synthesizer yeah. and you have synthesizer squared, what, um, <laughs> what you mean? Like the first synthesizer will make a sound yeah, and then you're going to send that sound into this other synthesizer and you are going to alter that sound again. Uh, well, actually, what you can do is uh, you you this one. There are synths that where you can do that, where you can sort of chain them together. But in this case, what I'm what I'm describing is using. Uh, so the, the the main the downside for the pocket piano is that it has this keyboard, which is not like they're little tiny circles of wood. Uh, so it, it, you can learn to play it, but it's only got a couple octaves, and so it's it's not really great if you're really trying to like really play if you're if you know how to play regular keys. So you can use another synthesizer or another keyboard to send MIDI into it. So what I would do is then chain that, like have the outputs from those two different synths running into to play at the same time or like play in a performance. And then, but the, the, the note messages from the first synth are driving, uh, sending notes to this, to this pocket piano. Um, but you can also just use it standalone, which is what I find myself doing most often. Right, but again, so it sounds like what you're using as a second synthesizer is just for the keyboard That's part right. of it instead of having these little wooden knobs that you're kind of trying to play on, you can play on a regular keyboard and then, but, but you would use the, the synthesizers um, synthesization process rather than the other one. That's right. And that's where I, it, like I say, it's, it deceptively looks like a toy and every one of my kids when they've been little has like wanted to pick it up and play it. And, and they can actually like, you can't hurt it. Like it's, it's very, very simple. Like the knobs are sturdy and the, so I like, I have lots of funny videos of my kids like noodling around on it, but then you can just plug it into a regular like musician's rig and it, and it works like a real instrument. So it's this really interesting and re sort of robustly made uh, very limited, very simple device. Um, and uh, I, I will say that it's it's they they recently I think discontinued making them because they the the company Critter and Guitar is now a new model that's called the the Organelle which is actually much more like a music computer. Uh, especially I think it's a Linux maybe an Ar, maybe an Arduino. Not let's see no, what's the Pocket Linux uh, uh, box that you can have in a very small uh, form factor? Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. I think it's built on a Raspberry Pi or something very similar. Um, and it can do a whole lot more. I actually have one of those as well, but I don't love it as much uh, because it does like the version I got didn't have that built in speaker. It also didn't run on battery. So you couldn't just sort of kick it around or throw it in a bag or like take it to the beach um, and play with it. And this, that's what you can do with this thing. It's just like a, it's like a real instrument. How much does it cost? So I think I paid uh, like 175 and I agonized over it because I was like, it looks like a toy. And then once I got it, I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I want to buy another. Um, but now I price them used on like Reverb or eBay for like uh, 400. So they because they're mm. scarce now, they're going up. Yeah. But it's still significantly less expensive than like Teenage Engineering OP1. Yes, which I I also have and love, um, and it's it's just a totally <laughs> the organelle is sort of like the open source version of the of the the op one. Oh, interesting. Uh, and and this is like this is this is not even trying to be that. This is just like uh, let's take a little synth engine and put it in a box and run it on a nine volt, so you can you can play it with your friends. I mean, I I've played this uh, with friends playing acoustic instruments, and it holds up just fine. That's really cool. You know, I've been wanting to build my own synthesizer based on a Raspberry Pi, and I haven't really found anything online about how to like have a, you know, a fake analog synthesizer that's running through the Pi. Do you know of anything like that? Uh, I, I'm so to, to, I'm a little rusty on my synth gearhead uh, chops. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, this one has stuck. I, I've, I go in seasons of like uh, recording music and then and not, not as much. And I'm in a not as much recording season this, right now, but I, <laughs> I, I recall a, um, I recall that there's several open source projects that, uh, that do build on some commodity hardware, 
but I'd, I'd have to dig them up to call them out my name. Okay. Okay. That's... Anyway, so that was the pocket piano. Just yep. Um, and you, and it sounds like you can probably find them eBay at the eBay at um, maybe vintage prices, so to speak. Um, but it is available. Okay, that's great. Yeah, and I do. I will say that um, the if you can get the later model, if you can find a later model, they added a feature that lets you latch the arpeggiator. So if you know anything about synths, like the arpeggiator is where it's like playing the notes in sequence, right? The my version, I have to hold the keys down for it to play, and then I have to tweak the knobs with the other hand. The being able to latch the keys and have it run is a really really valuable feature that they it's only available in some of the later models. So so aim for that one. Good to know. Cool. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, let's move on. Uh, what's your next, what's your next tool, Matt? <laughs> I, I agonize over this one because there were, uh, I'm, as, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm, I'm, I have just about six years ago discovered a love for hand tool woodworking. Um, I live in Los Angeles, live in Pasadena. Uh, I have a back patio space that I can work in. So I don't have a lot of room for a bit, a lot of power tools. Um, and so it really pragmatically, I got started with woodworking and, and hand tools. And the thing that you find with hand tools is, that uh, they are only as fun to use as you can keep them sharp. Um, and, and this is, I think, where a lot of folks get, get stuck with hand tool woodworking is like the practice of sharpening chisels and plane blades and, and that kind of thing. It really is a practice and you, it, it takes a little bit of time to get better at it. Um, and so if you're always using dull tools and they just get duller as you use them, uh, it's a pretty miserable experience. Um, so the the leather strop is a, a tool that I, I got clued into about two years into woodworking. I, I met another guy who was further into it than me, and he's like, "Well, do you do you strop?" And I was like, "I don't I don't know what you mean." <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, you need to you need to get you need to strop your tool." And I was like, "Okay, tell me tell me more." So I was sharpening my tools with with wet stones. So like. Uh, there's a kind of stone called an Arkansas stone. Uh, also, there's like all whole world of Japanese water stones people use. Those are all fine and good ways to sharpen your tools. But once you have the edge really sharp, um, it will dull with use depending on how much you use it. So the strop is a piece of leather. It could be anywhere from an eighth, eighth of an inch, a quarter inch thick if you can get it, uh, glued to a board that's flat. And then you can buy aluminum oxide, a sort of aluminum oxide compound and you rub the, the that into the leather and then once if your tool starts to dull as long as there's no nicks in the blade or like nothing no major damage to the edge you can take that tool and like push it really hard like run it along the strop 15 30 times and that tool is is razor sharp again and you can do that 10 or 15 times in between going back to the stones uh and so it, it what it means is that you can actually keep your tools really really sharp without uh, having to do nearly as much work to do so. And, and, um, you can either, it sounds like you can either buy one of these or you can actually make a strop. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Like it's, it's, I, I Googled around on this cause I was, uh, I was trying to find one I could link to you and I, you can find them on Amazon, but literally if you, if you have any leather, uh, <laughs> laying around the house for uh, maybe other DIY projects, all you need is like a, a small piece about, I don't know, um, three inches by uh, nine or 10 inches. And then again, just glue it to a board. And then you, I did order the, the, the stropping compound and there's different, there's different grits. Uh, I, I go, I use the green uh, grit. I don't know what, what <laughs> level it is, um, but it's, I think the stropping compound, you get like a big bar of it um, that's uh, for, for about six bucks. And I've, I've gone through like maybe a quarter of it in two years. Um, but in terms of the experience of, of woodworking and like using hand tools, using like particularly like the steel blades, which is like most of most of hand tool woodworking, like it really does transform that experience. And, and it, what it means is that you actually will stop what you're doing and say, oh, let me go grab the strop and just like take a few strokes on it and then get your tool really tuned up again rather than. What normally happens with me anyway is I'm like, okay, well, I really need to sharpen this, but let me just finish this this one last bit, and then you tear out a huge chunk of, you know, whatever you're working on, and you're <laughs> you're cursing, you're you're cursing, you're ever starting this hobby. Well, strops. Okay, I didn't know about strops either, so that's that's good. Although I just got a stone recently to to, to sharpen our kitchen knives. Um, yeah. And um, I'll have to strop afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I, I have used it on kitchen knives. I, I recently, so my woodworking practices got me sharpening. 
And that actually got me getting into sharpening our kitchen knives for the first time ever. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Like once you get, you work with a dull tool and then suddenly you have a sharp tool, it's life changing. But yeah, I use it on the kitchen knives as well. Um, and unlike with the sharpening that you have to do on a stone, you need to maintain a precise angle to not mess up your edge. The stropping doesn't require that hand skill. Like you literally just, because the leather, um, you, you dig the tool into the leather and the leather conforms to the edge of the tool. And so that abrasive just slides right along the existing edge. That's part of why it's easy. Okay, I got it. And cool. just one quick question before we move on. If you have like uh, a lot of times, like I, I carve spoons mm -hmm. and I have like special tools that are kind of curved. They look like yeah. little. Can you use a strop to sharpen those too? So Mark, I also carve spoons. What kind of tools cool. are you talking about? Um, it, it looks like, it almost looks itself like a little spoon with the tip like flattened. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's, or it's, it's a U, U shape cross section. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so sharpening curved tools, you, you can definitely use the strop on them. Um, as long as you can get, is you can rock. So I use, I, I carve it a lot of gouges which are mm -hmm. like chisels, but like with a U-shaped profile, mm -hmm. uh, like curved around. And I find that the, um, the, the strop is especially helpful on those because uh, sharpening those on stones is actually quite tricky to not mess up the edge. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. Anything that's made of steel, um, leather strop is, is a great way to, 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 to hone it back up um, without having to, to do the careful sharpening that you, you would need to do. You still have to do it, but just like 10 to 15 times less often. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's a huge difference. Right, that's a huge yeah. difference. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. All right, so uh, tell us about your next tool. Okay, so um, the other the other um, the the art practice that I've most been investing in lately, and this this really started again with sort of life with kids, is like uh, I said, I used to paint a lot. I used to do a lot of drawing and visual art, and then when I get really busy, or I, then I I tend to gravitate that 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 same composition comes uh comes through in photography so i've been shooting photos uh pretty seriously since college off and on and uh lately i just got a, a manual focus lens uh for the first time ever and it's a it's a voigtlander 40 millimeter f 1.4 um and this is this is definitely the mino uh the mino influence you <laughs> mentioned mino he's a he's a real pro photographer so yeah. i bought i bought a couple of old cameras from mino that he's no that he's moving out of. I'm I'm a version dragger on cameras. I buy older cameras because I'm not a pro. Uh, so I'm shooting a, a Fujifilm X Pro One, but I can adapt. I can use an adapter to put almost any um, almost any uh, lens that I that I want onto that camera. Um, and what I found with the with the 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 manual focus lenses, um, I, like I I tried to shoot manual before in the past. Um, but I, I hadn't had much luck. And what I, what I found with this one is that the ergonomics of it, because it's built to be shot manual, like I tried to shoot manual lenses, like or I tried to shoot uh, autofocus lenses in manual mode, and it's just not a very good experience. But the lens that's actually been designed to use this way, um, it's a totally different experience. Like the throw of the focus wheel, like it actually has a little special tab for your finger. So you can sort of like, um, you can move it without having to grasp around the barrel of the lens. Um, and, and the, like all the, the, all these design aspects of the ergonomics of how you, you handle this lens suddenly make it actually possible to shoot manual. Um, and I had always thought like shooting manual sounds like you're stepping backwards. Uh, like we have autofocus, why should we, shouldn't we use it? But once you start shooting this way, uh, like you notice all these advantages, like uh, shooting kids, for example, like I'm, I often am trying to get a shot with my kids or I'm, we're out walking like, and, and if you're shooting autofocus, you have to like press the button down halfway, wait for it to autofocus, check, take the shot. You have to keep doing that focus dance, uh, and, and then recomposing. Whereas with this, uh, I, I focus once I get it right. And then I just work on like waiting for the right moment. Um, so it really has changed the way that I shoot. Nice. And, um, you say that it, you can use an adapter to put any kind of lens on any kind of like a manual lens. And, yep. um, uh, and so you would be looking for these, these would be vintage lenses primarily, right? Things that, that were made probably long ago there. I don't know if they're still making manual lenses or not, but they definitely you, are. They are. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I have bought, uh, I've, I bought several um, vintage lenses. Um, eBay is full of them. 
Um, and but to be honest, I haven't really been happy with any of them. Uh, and I have a couple of friends like Mino and another guy named Brandon Stedman who shoot Leica cameras. Uh, they 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 shoot Leica digitals or they shoot Leica film cameras. And Leica are these sort of like classic rangefinder iconic form cameras. They look like a simple rectangle with a lens in it and a little window that you look through. And you know they're they're sort of lauded again for their ergonomics and design. But there is a whole ecosystem of lens makers that serve the, the Leica community. Um, and so Voigtlander, this one that made the lens that I just bought, this they're, they're continuing to make um, new iterations of those classic manual focus lenses that are primarily for people shooting in this way. I mean, you're, but you're, and you're using it to shoot digital rather than film. That's right, that's right. Uh, so I have this adapted to a 12 year old uh, Fujifilm camera, which I love, which is honestly like the, the X-Pro1, X-Pro2, like they're trying to copy this look of this Leica rangefinder. Even the the um, the the it, they even have an optical viewfinder you can look through. I can't shoot the manual lens that way because it doesn't it doesn't give me a way to see if I'm in focus. But it, you can hit a switch on it and you can look through this camera and have an electronic viewfinder in the same little window. And so using that electronic viewfinder, I can see uh, sort of focus peaking, um, and that lets me that lets me get a, a, an accurate focus. Uh, with a manual lens through a digital camera. Okay, cool. So um, tell us about Loop. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to tell, so I'll try to keep it concise. But um, as, I, as you mentioned in the intro, my, my youngest of three daughters was diagnosed with type 1 about three years ago. And to understand why this is a, a significant tool, you need to understand how what living with type 1 is like. You're essentially playing uh, a slow motion game of Pong with your blood sugar. Uh, and uh, in that, like, if you eat carbs, your blood sugar goes up. Normally, in a normally functioning person's uh, body, their pancreas will make insulin and push that blood sugar down uh, and it keep it in a nice range. Well, that doesn't work for people with type 1 because our, their pancreases don't make insulin in the same way. And so you have to sort of do that manually. Um, and people have all kinds of tools they use to do that. They use insulin pumps, but it's it, you have to play that game of Pong, but it's Pong with a 15-minute time delay. And if you fail... Uh, if, if the blood sugar goes high or goes low, uh, then someone that you love or yourself could be uh, get really sick or possibly die. Um, and so it's it's the simplest thing in the world to do, but you just have to do it forever, <laughs> uh, like 24-7. Um, and so, of course, it's ripe for automation. Um, so uh, basically what, what happened was there were companies that had made glucose monitors that are wearable devices that have it put a wire into your skin and measure your glucose in real time and send out a Bluetooth ping with that data to your phone or to a receiver every five minutes. And there, are, of course, you've seen insulin pumps that like deliver insulin and they deliver a small amount of insulin all the time, simulating your sort of background or basal insulin. But then they also let you give a big bolus of insulin or a big dose of insulin when you eat carbs. So what, what Loop does is it, basically what happened was uh, People in the community of people living with type one uh, got tired of waiting for somebody to hook these devices up. Um, and they, uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Ben West who, who spent years scrupulously <laughs> decoding the radio uh, control messages for his pump. Um, and then there was a guy named Nate Rackleft who uh, designed an iOS app that uh, could take advantage of those control codes. And a guy named uh, Pete Schwamm who developed a, another little uh, circuit board that basically ran a translation between um, the Bluetooth that a phone could transmit and the radio frequency controls for the pump. So they, it was a true open source project. They, they found each other online, they found each other's work, they downloaded the code from GitHub, and they, they built this app that could essentially close the loop on that process and automate it. Um, by, by receiving that data from the glucose monitor, um, you tell it what carbs you've eaten, and then it makes an extrapolation out of what's gonna happen over the next, in the next few hours. And then it can adjust what the insulin pump is dosing up and down 24 seven. Um, and most notably, I mean, this is with my, my, my daughter when like, when we got this up and running, um, I, I, I'll never forget sitting on the bed, like holding an iPad, watching this remotely happen. Uh, my wife and I were just crying because like we had our, like we had been doing this job 24 seven for six months. And suddenly we had now this robot nanny that was like doing it uh, all day, all night. And we were just the manager. Uh, we could just sort of watch it happen, give a nudge here or there. We still have to intervene from time to time, but uh, it, it, it doesn't get bored with the task. 
uh, and it doesn't get sleep deprived, <laughs> um, and it does it in a predictable way. And so, the, the, so the, again, the, the end result is that this is a phone app, an app on your phone. Yep. That is that where you input what it's called. Let's say you're the you're the patient. You in, input what you're eating. That's right. You're you're and as, is it types of food, amounts of uh, food mostly mostly carbs. So uh, right. pro, with protein and fats absorb much more slowly. Okay. Um, and so they're actually so because this is an open source community. And I mean, as a as a as a product designer, where this really hit me is that like this design really came from the community. Um, right. Like, so I, I, I want to just go, again go back to what the actual tool is. So, yeah, it's an yeah. app you input um, the the stuff that you eat, and then the app will uh, communicate with um, some pumps. The app receives data from the glucose monitor from every the glucose five minutes. Monitor. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and then, then with with, when you, it has the information you've told it about the carbs, right. it also communicates with the pump, so it knows how much insulin has been given already. Right, and it does that by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or something. So the CGM talks to the phone via Bluetooth, and right. the phone talks Bluetooth to um, this this communications bridge called a Riley Link. It's mm -hmm. actually named for Pete's daughter Riley, uh, and then that basically translates the ra the Bluetooth to radio frequency comms that the pump can receive. Okay, and and so um, and, and that pump is something that 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 you wear. That's right. The CGM and the pump are both wearable devices. The CGM okay. has a wire under the skin measuring glucose in your interstitial fluid, and the pump is delivering insulin under the skin. So there's three kind of kind of you're kind of wearing the phone too. So these three devices yeah, that you right. are wearing um, can regulate, and and they do this this um, you could say this ping pong of of um, regulating, delivering, and then measuring back, and then you go through a whole loop. So the only kind of input that's required is for the person to record what, what they're eating. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I've talked to some, some other folks that use it that are uh, live more dangerously than my wife and I do in, in how we care for our, our, our own daughter, uh, and they just don't input the carbs because the, the system will actually uh, – it will read your increase in glucose, and it will – it will assume that you have eaten carbs uh, and will actually start dosing insulin that way. It works better if you input them, um, but that's sort of the long game. Uh, and, and now I would say, so we got started this about three years ago. Um, and what it's, it's done is really catalyzed the industry to, uh, to like taking a, a hard look at like this experience and this user experience and say, oh, wow, there actually does seem to be one demand for this. And also like um, a, a pretty large and growing community of people who are, uh, who are using devices in an off-label way? And I have to say, uh, like this is this is me with my diabetes dad hat on. Like what we're doing at Tidepool is building on this work. Um, but this this uh, I, I got started with this long before I started working there. And so it's we we do need to like maintain a boundary. Like the DIY community is still an ongoing thing, and we're we're really trying to build on that work. Uh, but it's a it's a separate thing. Okay, and and so. Um, so you said that some people actually don't even need to input the uh, what they're eating; that, that they all the devices are just reading the increase in the in the glucose and then making it. And so, um, uh, and, and is this like to have this set up these these three parts? Is this something that people have to kind of assemble themselves, or is this now at this point, or is, it, is this what you're doing, where you sell this kind of as a package, or is this this is integrated into into a single system? So right now, if you want to do this, what I what I call refer to as do it yourself loop, which is what we're talking about here, uh, you need to you need to download the code, you need to build it in Xcode on your Mac and install it on your phone. Uh, you also need to have the devices, um, but a lot of people uh, use these same devices just in regular diabetes care, and they get those devices, um, they're prescription devices, but they're uh, they're they're used in a different way when when integrating into the system. What, what we're doing at Tidepool is we're taking this, this open source software uh, and we're actually bringing it to the FDA uh, for review and, and, and building on this existing amazing DIY work and design, but making it available in the iOS app store. That's, that's the plan. And we have official partnerships with the manufacturers of the devices. Um, and so we really want to take this from a DIY uh, sort of uh, diabetes hacking project and turn it into a thing that really anybody who wants to use it can just download from the app store. So if if there was a listener out there who had somebody themselves or somebody in the family who had you know type one diabetes, and they wanted to um, 
do this themselves, w- w- where do they go? What's the first step for them? Uh, the first step would be to go to loopdocs.org, where there's extensive documentation on the project and how to set it up. Um, but there's also a really wonderful Facebook uh, community group that's that uh, where people go for support uh, and also help in setting up called uh, called Looped L O O P E D, um, and that's a that's a Facebook group. Um, and uh, so between those two places, but you definitely want to start at loopdocs.org, um, and that links to everything. Okay, that's great. That sounds like such a fascinating project. And uh, again, another example of what happens when makers get together and kind of leapfrog what uh, established um, uh, industries are, are working on. Um, yeah, and for me, what's really exciting is this. it's obvious that the industry is kind of listening and looking as they should be, and that um, eventually this becomes something that um, you don't have to do yourself if you don't want to. Right. It's like uh, espresso machines. Um, <laughs> people have been making espresso machines for 150 years. And then about 15 years ago, somebody put a PID temperature control system into their own espresso machine at home. And it, <laughs> it locks the temperature down to like one tenth of a degree. Um, when typical espresso machines like have a 20 degree temperature swing. And after the hacking making community adopted this PID temperature control stuff, now all the high-end home espresso machine manufacturers put PID in it, but they never would have thought of it unless these makers yeah. did it. Yeah, exactly. And they probably were watching the YouTubers do it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yes. so, so, um, so Matt, we're, we're just about a time, just about out of time, but I wanted you to uh, just talk a little bit about your podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I make a podcast with a group of friends and, and lately my, my oldest daughter has joined in, uh, and my, kind of taken the, taken the, taken it on as, as partly her project as well. It's called dad's review kids shows, uh, where a bunch of dads, uh, sort of get together. Um, it really started as just us complaining about the, the, the sort of really terrible shows <laughs> that our kids were watching. And we, uh, some friends and I got together and we're just sort of riffing on, on what we thought was poorly constructed about these shows, but it's really turned into, uh, uh something deeper than that. We actually had a, uh, a while back we had, we had interviews with the, the creators of Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. I like to, so you started to say what it was. So it was, um, <laughs> It, it's a podcast where you review um, kids shows. Is that that's right? It it's dads reviewing kids shows. And kids uh, shows meaning meaning what? Shows that our kids watch. So like on everything. TV show, like a yep. TV show or a video? that's right. That's what right. What would be an example? Uh, we did we did um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, we did Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood versus Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, we did Magic School Bus. Um, uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender, um, very positively reviewed, um, and um, we have an upcoming episode about uh, a Netflix series called The Dragon Prince. So these are like little kids ones. It wouldn't be like Midnight Gospel or something. <laughs> uh, so the the our kids are of varying ages. So mm-hmm. we've gone uh, all the way from like Curious George, which is pretty young kids, to I mean, Dragon Prince is pretty is pretty uh, has some dark moments. So mm-hmm. um, my my kids range from fourteen to four, uh, and um, it's, it's it's so it's pretty broad ranging. It's really whichever show that we we think is ready is right for review, uh, mm-hmm. or lately whichever show my daughter is insistent that we that we that we review. That sounds really cool. And, it's um, a lot of fun. and and so are the kids involved uh, or is it a conversation with the kids or is it just the dad sitting around reviewing it? It started off uh, the latter, uh, just the dad sitting around uh, sort of like snarkily uh, uh, complaining. And then now the, the kids have pushed their way in. And so <laughs> it's it's a really interesting dialogue between uh, our, our take on, on what we find good or bad about the show and then the kids counter argument. Um, and so it's it's. Uh, it's 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 evolved <laughs> and is there is there a high degree of divergence in general from what the dads like versus what the kids like or is there generally shows that work for the dads also work for the kids or vice versa uh that's a great question i would say it varies show to show i mean obviously the we are picking shows that either we really like or we really dislike because it makes for a more interesting conversation um but uh, the the goal, I think, with any family, like we're trying to find shows 
that we can enjoy, all enjoy watching, which is a real challenge with a wide age group of kids. So uh, shows like Avatar The Last Airbender, for example, are sort of family favorites um, because they have great writing, but there's also they're also accessible to uh, kids, have great character development and themes. Um, yeah, so it, it really depends on the show. And is this all fiction too? So far, uh, although there's no there's no rules, <laughs> we 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 don't we don't have a lot of rules. It really is just uh, uh, it's it's um, it is in no small part a chance to sort of get together with with uh, with families uh, who you know we we are in a similar place with our with our with our child raising and with our parenting um, and uh, also face the same challenge like what what are we going to watch? Okay. Cool. So Matt, tell us where people should go if they want to find out more about your work and, and what you're all about. Um, I would say that the most updated place is Instagram. Uh, I do all the, all the woodworking and stuff is there. All the photography is there. So that's, I'm Matt Lumpkin at Instagram. I'm also Matt Lumpkin at Twitter. Um, and uh, if you want to see the more design side, uh, there's a lot of stuff at, at work.mattlumpkin.com. Very cool. Matt, this has been such a blast talking to you and finding out everything that you do. I, I, we both live in the LA area. I'd love to come by and visit sometime when we're allowed to uh, leave the house. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yes, that would, I would love that. Hey everybody, it's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools, that's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wieland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O., Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malt and Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. <laughs>